Hi, I'm Julie, and I want to give a very brief presentation about the Chinook Indians, our own neighbors here in Astoria area, talk a little bit about their maritime culture. This map shows obviously the Columbia River and where it goes into the Pacific Ocean, and all of these dots represent the villages where the Chinook Indians lived, at least during the time when explorers came and could observe them and count them and put this map together. They have lived in this area for over 10,000 years. And the Chinook Indians are defined as a group, as Indians that live on the water, the Columbia or the ocean, and who share a similar language, the Chinook language. Everything about their culture is related to water in some way, which is why this talk is called where water comes together with other water. Here you see the Columbia River a little bit east of here um, in the gorge area. And then the, the place where we know, which is where the Columbia River pours into the Pacific Ocean. Very beautiful and very dangerous area. One of the disadvantages of living here in this, this coastal area is the severe and unpredictable weather patterns so if you can imagine being out in a canoe out in the Pacific Ocean or the Columbia River Bar or the river itself when the current and the tide and the weather combine to make it very, very dangerous conditions, even with our own modern boats with every kind of instrument available, a couple of them sink every year. It's a very dangerous place to be a mariner, one of the most dangerous places in the world. The upside of living here, of course, is the abundant food that's available. Of course, on land, you have your elk and deer and all the different animals. Quite a, a wide variety of plants, including huckleberries and fern, and a, a type of potato that you can dig up. But the marine life is very rich here, and the Chinook Indians would eat whale, sea lion, seals, otters, all kinds of fish, um, especially salmon, halibut, tuna, and shellfish, including crab, clams, shrimp, and so on. Very rich um, food supply, which was never ending during their time, very sustainable. This site's familiar to us, of course, if you go clam digging, a uh, razor clam, which was an important food source for them. And then they also would use the shells to make little dishes and containers out of, and also because they are razor sharp, um, use them as a tool. I love this picture. It shows the Chinook mythology or cosmology of the origin of people. They believe that the first people came out of a clam shell, and I love the picture of these little feet and these little people climbing out of the clam shell with Raven to guide them on their path. This is a Chinook family as drawn by one of the first white explorers to come to the area. You see the dad on the left um, wrapped up in a blanket. The men usually didn't wear clothes. Now, partly that's because of our weather. If you wore something made out of leather, it was very likely that it would get slimy and rotten over time. Plus, if you're in and out of the water, in and out of the canoes all of the time, you'd just be wet anyway. The, some of the observers noticed that the Chinook Indians didn't seem to really feel um, the cold from the cold water. I guess they were used to it. And you have the mother on the right, and she's helping with some, bring in some salmon for dinner. And on her back, her, her baby is actually in a tiny little canoe. And I love this. The idea is that even from birth, you are put into a canoe. That's the strong connection that they have to the water. You might notice that their heads are shaped a little bit different. This painting gives a, a another interpretation of what they look like. They weren't born this way. They flattened their baby's heads when they were very, uh, very tiny, and the, your skull is soft when you're born. You can see the cradle board that she's holding this baby in to flatten its head. They considered it to be a sign of beauty, and they thought that people who had rounded heads were ugly and were only fit for slavery. Um, notice this little baby is wearing the blue beads. I showed that in the Lady Washington presentation. So this family has been trading with 
with white people to get those beads and it shows you how important and valuable this little baby is. More recent photograph, they stopped doing the head flattening um, after the white people arrived and told them they shouldn't do it. And she's quite beautiful. Um, Chinese coins were often found in the jewelry of the Chinook Indians, showing the evidence of the early trade that would have brought things from China. And shells were a very popular form of jewelry and decoration. Her little hat would, is woven out of little shreds from, of bark from the cedar tree, and it was a rain hat. Beautiful young woman on her wedding day. You can again see the Chinese coins and the shells and beautiful decoration. The women uh, in the Chinook tribe um, did most of the traditional women's work that we see in hunter-gatherer communities. So that would be mostly gathering plants, um, shellfish, uh, preparing food, learning how to preserve it, how to cook it, how to share it with everyone, taking care of the house, the children, and so on. A young man. And again, the, the men's duties in the Chinook Indian tribe were similar to hunter-gatherer cultures around the world. Primarily, their job was fishing and hunting, um, securing the meat or the protein that would feed the family or the village, um, providing defense against invaders or outsiders, and they were the ones who built and sailed the magnificent canoes. Uh, women did help with the fishing. Um, here they are using nets to pull in some salmon, and she's carrying her baby. I love this picture. They used wooden floats to help the um, nets stay afloat and they use stones as weights to help part of them hang down. Everybody had a job to do, even the elderly. This old man who is blind was given the task of keeping the, the salmon, you can see it smoking there, yum, and his job was to keep it safe, keep dogs, intruders away from it. Oh, missed the house picture, sorry. Um, the beautiful canoes, they were, each one would be made out of one cedar tree. The longest could be 150 feet long, which is longer than the Lady Washington. First, they would burn out the center of it with fire, and then they would continue to carve it with uh, stone tools, antlers, bones, and things like that. The man uh, in a tribe who was responsible for making the canoes was a very, very important member of the community. The boats were highly prized, quite valuable, and they were expert canoers. And when the first white explorers came, they were astonished at how well these people could um, navigate and sail and paddle around both in the river and out at sea. Here we have a family going on a, a journey somewhere. The canoes were used for everything. If you wanted to pick berries, you, you would often hop in a little canoe and then paddle over to where you thought the berries might be. If you were gonna hunt for a deer, you would take your canoe and sail to a little creek or something, some area where you'd go hunt for the deer. Fishing, of course, visiting your friends. Even if you wanted to capture slaves, you would take your boat upriver and capture a slave and bring it home. If you were looking for a bride, you would go downriver because your social status was related to your place on the river. The closer you were to the ocean, the higher your status in the community. They're getting ready to go out and, and perhaps hunt for a whale. This is an enormous canoe. That would be an ocean going canoe. I love the um, carving of the animal on the side. It looks like some kind of a shaman at the front to help guide them on their journey. It would be an interesting project to compare their canoes to the longboats that the Viking used. I can see a lot of similarities just looking at them, the way the men are sitting, the way that they use their paddles, and the way that the prow of the boat is jutting out, and the use of animal decoration. And yet they live on the other side of the world. Sometimes they fished uh, from shore by using spears or nets, so they didn't always use boats. They have other ways of collecting fish as well. Here are some of the sinkers I mentioned earlier. Um, made A lot of them were made in animal shapes or with animal references to bring good luck. And you would wrap a piece of twine around this and weight your 
net down so that the fish could get caught in the net. Those uh, stone weights were often made by the men. The women did beautiful weaving, a basket like this that could hold food. And this is on the right side is a rain hat. And if you look closely, you can see a picture of a canoe and they're hunting or pulling in. It looks like a whale to me. Um, it's a beautiful rain hat woven out of shreds of bark from a cedar tree. At end of life, you were buried in a canoe. So think about the journey, the amount of time spent in their boats. The boat was uh, usually put in view of the water. It was lifted up on stilts like this or sometimes put into trees. The dead person would be put into the canoe so that they could sail on to their afterlife. Another funny coincidence, the Vikings also had boat funerals or boat burials. They're actually quite common around the world. Um, and if you were a higher status person, a lot of your personal belongings would be in the canoe with you. Uh, pots and pans, weapons, different things that you had in your life. Um, unfortunately, uh, slaves would sometimes be tied to the, the boat canoes so that they would die to accompany the, the mariner into the next world. I wanted to include this picture to talk a little bit about the fact that their exposure to the white sailors who came on the tall ships decimated their culture. At one time there were uh, as many as 40,000 Chinook Indians living up and down the Columbia River and today there are, at the last census, there are 609 people who identify as Chinook. Um, they were some of them were murdered or massacred. Uh, some of them got diseases from the white people, including tuberculosis, measles, um, venereal disease, and they didn't have the genetic resistance that, to, to stand up to it. Um, they were very uh, likely to become alcoholic if they were given alcohol because, they again, they didn't have the genetic resistance to it, and so alcohol was a big problem for them led to an early death. Um, this, the sadness and the, the stress and the anxiety of being taken over by the whites and having their land taken away and so on led to a very, very high number of suicides in the Chinook tribe as well. This old woman, uh, this picture was taken in Portland and she's taking care of, of someone's baby. And I, I wanted to mention that when I was, I grew up in Portland and in the 1960s, I remember very clearly seeing um, a lot of Native American men down, downtown in the Old Town area along the river. And my memory is that a lot of them were drunk and uh, homeless and basically dying there along the waterfront, which is a very sad um, conclusion to um, 10,000 years of a rich history along the river. The Chinook Nation today is not recognized by the federal government and a long list of treaties that the government has had promising them different things through time. Many of them were not honored. So it's a very unfortunate thing that it has come to this point. Um, but I wanted to show you the rich, rich legacy and history of these people and um, I hope that this presentation will inspire you with your own research project of choosing an early culture that lived near the water and finding out what you can about the boats that they built, how they use them, and their relationship to the sea. Thank you.